today, brothers and sisters, we are going to take a look at the different divisions and departments within the Christian church community. These divisions and the diversity that is found in the various ministry efforts of the Christian church, the different functional departments and divisions of the Christian church, these special giftings, the talents, all of these resources that individual believers possess All of these things make up what we consider the Christian church, our local church communities. Now, these different ministries who use these resources, who use the gifts, who use the abilities that believers possess that have been given to them by God. It's a diversity of gifts special spiritual giftings. All of these things are present within the Christian church community. And on the surface, when we get to looking into it, it may seem quite complicated. There are different functions and different departments within a local church community, pastoral functions, operational functions, facility management functions. There are different ministries within a local church community and the global Christian church community, the youth ministry, the older adult ministry, the worship and praise ministries. Then we have the outreach ministry, the missions ministries, and there are several other ministries and other ministry efforts where people serve and where the church serves the community where it is located within. The people are the hands and feet of these ministries, of these departments. These hands and feet are the functioning and the operational parts of the church community. And brothers and sisters, that is you and that is me the people, the believers. So what we will find in today's scripture that we will be going over is that each believer within a local church community is given special abilities and talents from the Spirit of God and from God's grace. We are given these things, these resources, these abilities, these talents to accomplish the goal and the purpose of God and Christ in the earth. But before we continue, brothers and sisters, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds, so that we may hear your word. Heavenly Father, we ask that your word come into us and change our hearts and minds according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I said, brothers and sisters, today we're going to take a look at the organizational structure of the Christian church. And in this structure, we will find how the gifts or what gifts that each believer possess, the resources, the talents and the abilities that God has poured out for his church and the earth to use. And not only the local church community, but the global church community. Brothers and sisters, these things, these gifts operate all over the world in every church, Christian church around the world. And one way that we can begin to easily understand this organizational structure is by making a comparison an analogy to what many of us may know as a modern business, a large corporation. 
Within a large corporation, you will have different functional departments. And these functional departments, such as the management department and function, the sales department and function, and the operations department and function, these departments and functions make up the basic structure of a corporation. The sales department or function handles the retail face of a corporation. They do this through direct sales, through marketing, through advertising, and customer service. The next function and department of a corporation is the operations department. The operations department handles the shipping, the warehousing, the manufacturing of products, and also product handling. When an order is placed in the sales department, the sales department passes that order on to the operations department, and the, it is the operations department that fulfills that order. They get the product out to the customer. The last department and function of a corporation is the management function. And the man management function makes sure, makes sure that all of the different departments, sales, operations, all of these departments and functions are operating in a cohesive manner, that they're working together. The management function and department takes care of human resources. That would be payroll. That would be benefits and insurance. The management function also takes care of facilities management, paying the light bills, expanding or repairing the building and the equipment that are used in the corporation. Now, one thing to note about each of these functions and departments within a corporation is that they each perform a unique service that is valuable, essential for the corporation. Without the sales department, you wouldn't have customers. There would be no marketing, no advertising, no retail sales, no customer service. Without the operations department, you wouldn't have the manufacturing of products, product handling, shipping. You wouldn't have the ability to get products out to the customers. And finally, without the management function and department, overlooking the entire organization, we wouldn't have payroll. You wouldn't have benefits, insurance, vacation time. You wouldn't have a facility to work in. You wouldn't have products and raw materials to work with. And you wouldn't have the different departments, sales and operations working together in a cohesive manner. The main thing that I want us to begin to see in that analogy of a corporation is that separate departments, the separate functions of an organization, they fit together to form a cohesive unit And that cohesive unit, that unit has a singular purpose. And once you get all of those departments and functions operating correctly and in unison, you then begin to have a functioning and prosperous corporation. You begin to have a business that works and that can serve the community in which that business or that corporation operates within. Up until now, we've just discussed the different departments and the functions that make up a corporation. So now let's talk about populating those departments with people, with equipment, 
What skills do we need for the sales department? What skills and talents and abilities do we need for the operations department? What skills and talents do we need for people who work in the management department? For example, the sales department needs salespersons. They need a telephone, computers, cash registers, a storefront. That storefront would be where pla a place where customers can come and visit. And that storefront can be either a brick and mortar establishment or a digital platform. The operations departments, they need a warehouse. They need trucks and forklifts and forklift operators. The management department, it needs managers, copy machines, financial management software, big offices with windows overlooking beautiful scenery. Now, before we get into Romans chapter 12, because because this is where we are going to start looking at the organizational structure of the Christian church. We're going to look at the gifts that that God has given to the church in the earth. And these gifts, gifts that come with a believer's faith has been distributed to individual believers in Christ's church. As we go over these gifts, I want us to begin to look at how these gifts fit together in a cohesive manner in the overall church structure now, I don't expect everyone to get it at first. It will start coming together when we begin to look at the different departments or offices of Christ's church. We will get into that in Ephesians chapter 4. But for right now, let's start in Romans 12 verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Here, brothers and sisters, in Romans 12, we are presented with seven different gifts that accompany and are in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of us. Those seven gifts are prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leading, and mercy. The Apostle Paul tells us that these gifts accompany the faith that God has distributed to each of us. The gifts that we receive are different. 
just as the different parts that make up the body, your fingers, your hands, your toes, your feet, your legs, those are different parts and they perform different functions, but all of those parts, those many members of the body, all of the parts make up the body. When God built our human body, God put those parts together. He put the hand at the end of your arm, your wrists. He put your feet and attached it to your ankle. So each of the parts has a specific function on the body as a whole. God didn't put feet where your hands are. God didn't put ears where your nose is. God didn't put eyes on the back of your head. God put these parts, these different members, in specific places to serve a specific function for the body, to make it a cohesive unit. So here in Romans 12, we are given a description of the seven specific gifts. I like to call them the gifts from God. Gifts that are in accordance and which accompany the faith that God distributes to each one of us. Now we must realize that the faith that Christians have, that we have, is the same. It is only the gifts that are given to people that is a different gift. One person may receive one gift, the gift of prophesying. Another person may give, receive the gift of serving or teaching or encouragement. All of the members in the body of Christ possess one or more of these gifts. Some individuals may possess multiple gifts, but one gift may be dominant than the other. In verse 6, it says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, speaking with boldness, communication, effectiveness, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Now, these different gifts, brothers and sisters, the gifts that we are given are specifically tied to our Christian faith. They are to be used and understood as gifts associated with our faith in and from God. These are not gifts that just ordinary gifts that we have to use for ourselves. No, brothers and sisters, these are faith gifts. And each one of us is given a different gift or giftings. Now, let's take a closer look at those gifts. The first gift, the gift of prophesying. This gift deals with speaking and preaching in accordance with our faith in God. The Greek word means to speak forth. The individual with this gift, a gift that accompanies their faith, is able to speak effectively about their faith. Communication effectiveness, the ability to communicate matters of faith to others. The next gift is serving. Serving is synonymous with ministry. It is where we get the Greek word deaconess or deacon. This gift of serving is similar to the gift of helps. Serving, helping the church, ministering, serving others in accordance with one's faith. 
Brothers and sisters, each of these gifts is tied to our faith in God. The next gift is teaching. That's self-explanatory, just as the others, encouragement, giving, leading, and mercy. If we are to lead, we should do it diligently. If we are to show mercy, we should do it cheerfully, not begrudgingly. And all of these gifts must be in line with the faith that we have in God. In other words, brothers and sisters, we are to be using these gifts that we receive from God primarily for the body of Christ and not primarily for our worldly pursuits. Our lives should be so connected to our local church and the global church community that our first priority is seeking the kingdom of heaven and not necessarily making ourselves comfortable in worldly riches and worldly endeavors. Now, it should be obvious if you have the gift of giving, the Apostle Paul says, then give generously. That means you must have resources, physical resources, your time, your expertise, and any other talents that you may have or possess. These resources should be given to the local church community. But you must first have these things. If it's tangible resources that you want to give to the church, then you must first have the tangible resources, the physical resources, the money, the food, the clothes, the sheltering, the facility to shelter people. And if God blesses you with this gift of giving, God will also bless you with the gift, the resources to fulfill that gift. So our gifts operate in the world. They will benefit us as we go about in the world doing our normal routines. But we are to use the gifts, our gifts of faith that come with our faith to build and edify the church of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that should be our first priority. The important thing to remember as we move forward is that one believer is given one gift. Another believer is given a different gift. The Apostle Paul used the analogy of the different parts of the body. And that analogy is no different than the one I used of a corporate business, a corporation, the different departments within a corporation. I have a business background, so I used the structure of a corporation, the different functions, the different departments as an example, because as we go deeper, we will find that there are another set of gifts and another set of offices are appointments that believers receive from God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, there are a lot of different parts, functions, offices, appointments, gifts that have been given to the body of Christ in the earth. And all of these gifts, all of these functions, all of these talents and abilities, they work together. They're supposed to work together in a cohesive structure. And that's what we call the body of Christ. That next set of gifts, 
which will be the offices and the appointments, the departments, is found in Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Brothers and sisters, that is so important. The oneness, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Then he gets into verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Christ measured it out, apportioned out the measurements that is given to each believer. That is why it says when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Verse 9, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In verse 7, it says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And in verse eight, it says, and he gave gifts to his people. So here we have Christ, as it says in Matthew 28. Christ tells his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Christ lets us know that he has been given authority from the Father. So as we begin talking about these gifts or these appointments, offices, we can even look at them as the different departments, the different functions. They come from the Father through Christ. And the five gifts or appointments that come through Christ are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Paul, the one who wrote this letter to the Ephesian church community, was and is an apostle. The title apostle reflects an office. It reflects a function like a manager or an accountant, a sales representative, or even a sales manager. It could even be the sales department, that office. A person who holds the office of sales manager, that is their title. That is who they are and the function that they serve within a business, within that structure of a business. A forklift driver, a secretary, a general laborer, or a truck driver. These are all positions and offices that people hold within a company. You have doctors and nurses these are titles, these are offices, 
that people hold within the hospital structure. So as we now get into the five gifts are the appointments and offices that Christ gives for the working and operation of his church in the earth. It says So Christ gave himself verse 11 the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers verse 12 to equip his people for works of service to get to work so that the body of Christ may be built up. That's what these offices are for. So that we can start getting to work. And what is the work we are supposed to be doing? To build up the body of Christ. The first thing that we should notice is that these gifts, these appointments are slightly different than the seven gifts associated with our faith. The faith that we have in and from God in Romans chapter 12. These gifts from Christ, as I like to call them, are functional gifts, offices, appointments. In, the, in a hospital structure, you have nurses, you have doctors. A nurse performs the duties of a nurse. That office, that appointment, a doctor performs the duties of a doctor. Duties that are fitting are in line with his office. The office or the title corresponds to the duties that are performed by the person that holds that office or title. Paul is an apostle. So he performed and is performing the duties of an apostle. That office has passed away. Along with the office of prophet. The apostles job has been done. There were 12 apostles. 11 of Jesus disciples minus Judas and Paul was commissioned as an apostle by Jesus Christ. Those two offices, apostles and prophets, are replaced by the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. The apostles' job, when it was operating in the earth, was to bring and codify the word of God. An apostle, the word means the one sent. Sent to bring us the scriptures that we have today. The prophetic office, which has also passed away, was held by men in a local church community. And these men spoke direct revelation from God. Revelations that benefited their local church communities. That office has also passed away. The apostles were men who had walked with Jesus Christ and were directly trained by Christ in the earth to be apostles. Now that the apostles job is done, we have the New Testament gospel revelation of Jesus Christ, the Bible that we hold in our hands today. There is no need for further revelation from God outside of what the apostles have brought to us. The ones who were sent, they did and fulfilled their job. Those remaining offices, evangelists, pastors and teachers, those offices build upon what the apostles brought to us. And what the apostles brought to us, the prophets in local communities verified it 
what the apostles were teaching and sending to us, bringing to us as needed. Now, there are some Christian scholars in our community who like to combine the office of pastor and teacher. In my view and the view of other Christian scholars, that office of pastor and teacher, those two offices, I like to separate them based on a slight but important distinction. A pastor of a church is a leader and a teacher. In other words, a pastor holds an office of authority, leadership, and teaching. A pastor teaches. A teacher, the office of teacher, also holds a position of authority. They are teaching from the revealed and authoritative word of God. A teacher is also to be respected by those who sit under and submit to that teacher and the teacher's teaching. The biggest distinction between the pastor and the teacher is the scope of their authority and leadership. A pastor has to deal with the facility management aspects of a local church community. A pastor has to deal with paying the bills and managing the resources of the local church community. There are many teachers who may operate in a local church community. You have the individuals that teach in the children's ministry. You have the individuals who teach and instruct the youth ministry and the young adults. These teachers are well respected within the church community. They have a certain level of authority because they are teachers of the word of God. But these individuals do not perform the pastoral functions of a local church community. They don't pay the bills. They don't repair the building. They don't purchase a building. They don't manage the tithes and the free will offerings. They just show up and teach. There's a building for them to teach in. The air conditioning is working. There's discipline. There's security. They perform their function as teachers and then they leave the building. But it is the pastor's job to take care of the building, discipline the members, perform justice, perform weddings, funerals. So that distinction, I think it may be small, but it's very important. So in my view, even though pastors teach, teachers don't pastor. They're very valuable. So I like to separate those two offices. So you have the evangelist, you have the pastors, and the teachers. These are all offices that people hold in the local church communities. Now some people may ask, well where do I fit in? What is my office as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ? Some people may say, well I didn't go to seminary. I haven't been trained. Trained necessarily in an official capacity to hold an office in the church of Jesus Christ. And while that may be true, many of us have not been officially or corporately trained in a seminary. But that does not mean you cannot hold an office at some level in the church of Jesus Christ. Parents, for instance, are to be the pastors of their families. The father is to be the head of household for his family. Mothers and fathers, your children are your disciples. As parents, you hold a similar function and office for your family, for your household, just as a pastor does for the church community. 
many if not all of us are to be engaged in the office of being evangelists. We are to be men and women who proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ to the world of unbelievers. And for many of us, we are missing out on the gifts that Christ has poured out on his church. Many of us have a job. Many of us have a position with a title in the church of Jesus Christ. And we are not fulfilling it. Many of us are not showing up to work. And if you don't show up to work, brothers and sisters, everybody knows that you will not receive a paycheck at the end of the week or every two weeks. If you don't fulfill your position or a position, if you don't show up for work, you don't get the benefits. You don't get the perks that are associated with that position. So if you are one of those Christians who are not showing up for work, some call them secret agent Christians, Christian in name only. If the people at your job, if the people in your neighborhood, your family members, if they don't know that you are a Christian, if they don't know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, that you are a participating member in a local church community, if the people around you, your friends, your associates, your business partners, if they don't know anything about you being a Christian, and I'm not talking about proselytizing at work or in your community, for some people, that may be their calling, their gifting. But simply letting it be known in a reasonable manner that you are a Christian in your neighborhood, in your workplace, brothers and sisters, that is evangelizing. That is being a meaningful and effective representative of Jesus Christ in the work in the world and in the workplace. We are to be letting our light shine through how we live our life. Brothers and sisters, that's why we were saved in the first place, to let our light shine. And that serves as evangelizing. That is bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the non-believers, to the backslidden, to the transgressors. The more you engage in bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to your family, teaching them, disciplining and raising your children according to a parent's God-given authority and the will of God, If you are doing these things in your family, brothers and sisters, you are engaging in the functions of teaching and pastoring your family. These offices, these gifts and appointments of Christ are not just for the leaders of the corporate church. Brothers and sisters, these offices and appointments are for you and me to occupy and to begin functioning within. We are to use these gifts. We are to engage, apply, function in these offices and appointments that Christ has given to us. We are to be servants, faithful stewards of God's grace in the earth. Every Christian man or woman should be endeavoring to make their home a Christian home. There should be Christian living, Christian discipline, and Christian stewardship operating in every home of every Christian. If we are doing these things, brothers and sisters, then we are beginning to possess and operate in the gifts that God has given us through grace and the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Now, the next set of gifts, I like to connect them to the spirit of God because they are spiritual gifts. These gifts are directly connected to the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. We get introduced to these spiritual or special gifts and abilities. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul uses the same template in comparing the parts of the body and how all of these different spiritual gifts fit together. They're separate, but they are unified. All of the parts make up the one and they come from the one spirit. So when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we will see the spiritual gifts and we'll see the Apostle Paul using the same analogy of the body and the parts of the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now about the gifts of the spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. The Apostle Paul is starting to tie it together. Different gifts, but the same spirit. Gifts of the spirit. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. The offices. Different kinds of working. But all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. You have service, working, and gifts of the spirit, abilities and talents. Getting a little bit ahead of myself. Verse seven. Now to each one of the manifestations of the spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues all these are the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines just as the spirit determines now these are the nine gifts of the spirit presented to us by the Apostle Paul they are the word of wisdom word of knowledge special faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing spirits, special tongues, and interpretation of special tongues. Now, if we go back to Romans chapter 12, we will see the seven gifts that are associated and accompanying our faith in and from God. These gifts overlap and are incorporated with the gifts from the spirit. Those seven gifts are prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leading and mercy. The gift of prophecy. Teaching and encouragement. Th those gifts out of the seven identified in Romans 12 are directly connected to the speaking gifts given to us by the Spirit of God. 
the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, prophecy, special tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. Those are all talents and abilities from the Spirit. And they are speaking gifts that we receive through our faith in God and from the Holy Spirit of God. The other category of gifts out of the seven, leading, giving, and mercy. These are non-speaking gifts and they are all associated with the spiritual gifts of healing, working of miracles, distinguishing of spirits. Out of, and those gifts are the nine out of the nine gifts from the Holy Spirit. Special faith. I forgot one. The four gifts that are non-speaking is special faith, healing, the working of miracles, and the distinguishing of spirits. Those four gifts are non-speaking gifts. They are associated with service. They are associated with the non-speaking aspects of service and ministry. If we go back to that corporate example, you have the managing aspects, you have the sales and marketing aspects, you have the operations function of a corporation. A salesman or an individual who operates in the sales department, that individual must be able to communicate effectively with customers and be knowledgeable about the workings of a product a company deals in. A salesman must therefore possess speaking gifts. A salesman must have the talents and abilities that make their communication more effective to the world and the customers that he or she deals with. These speaking gifts, such as the words of wisdom and words of knowledge, Managers and leaders of a company and lower level managers in each department, like sales managers and even the executive manager, they must also be able to communicate effectively. The individuals who operate in the operations part of a warehouse, the product handler, the manufacturers, the guys that operate the machinery, they must be endowed with the gifts to serve. Doctors and nurses, they need to have the gifts of healing, the gifts of discerning the different problems that patients have when they come into the hospital, distinguishing of spirits. And there are some individuals who need special faith. That's faith, a strong and bolstering faith over and super abounding over normal faith. You see, brothers and sisters, the talents and abilities, those special spiritual gifts that we are given through the Holy Spirit of God, they work to fulfill our duties as outlined by God. Those duties are the seven gifts associated with our faith in and from God. Prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leading, and mercy. These are the things that we are to be doing in the earth. Prophesying, communicating our faith, serving, serving others, According to our faith, teaching, teaching others about our faith, about Jesus Christ, about the gospel, encouraging others in their faith journey, giving, helping 
and supporting our local church community, leading. We need to have leaders coordinating all of these efforts and duties in the body of Christ to make them unified and effective, developing a game plan and a strategy to address the specific challenges that a local, local Christian church community faces. That last duty is mercy. We are to be merciful to all people, including our brothers and sisters within the church. This is a list of our duties and responsibilities. But brothers and sisters, they were introduced to us as gifts. They were introduced to us as gifts that come with our faith. The gifts of God, the gifts that God gives us, the gift to serve, the gift to teach, the gift to give encouragement to others. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. We have the gift to give. We have the gift to prophesy, to speak boldly about our faith. We have the gift to be merciful to others. You see, brothers and sisters, there are some people in this world who can't be merciful to others. They don't have it within themselves to show mercy to others, to have forbearance, to hold off being judgmental, to withhold justice and give mercy to those who have offended us, to those who have spitefully mistreated us. Brothers and sisters, it is a gift it is something that you possess that has been given to you. It is something that comes with your faith in God to have it within yourself, within your spirit and in your being to be merciful to those who have treated you wrong. To call for peace, to call for reconciliations when others are out for blood and calling for justice. Brothers and sisters, some people don't have it within them to turn the other cheek when somebody slaps you in the face. Brothers and sisters, you need to have the gift of mercy. It comes with your faith in God. If it isn't in you, if you haven't received it and taken hold of it, then how can you give it to someone else? We have been given the gift of grace. We have been shown mercy. God has been merciful to us for every time that we have sinned. So when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, it is God being merciful to us. It is God pouring out grace, pouring it out all over our lives. The lives that we have lived full of sin. And if we find ourselves in a difficult situation, rather than promote justice, rather than get even, we need to dispense the gift of mercy that we received. And if we are going to give it, if we are going to give and show mercy to others, Give them another chance when they have made a terrible mistake over and over again. Show them mercy. God has shown you mercy. All of these seven gifts from our God, from God's grace, poured out over all of us. Specifically, and individually. Brothers and sisters, these gifts come with responsibilities. Once we receive them, it becomes our duty to dispense them in the world, to give them away to others. If we have been given the gift of prophecy, then brothers and sisters, we are to speak. We are to communicate effectively about our faith. All of those differing gifts that God has given to each one of us, 
We must endeavor to start pouring these gifts out into the world and into our local church communities. And it is those nine gifts of the spirit, the speaking gifts, the serving gifts. Now that we have a duty, now that we have a responsibility, how do we fulfill that responsibility? How do we fulfill our duty of pouring out our gifts that we receive? Well, that's where the spirit enables us, gives us the talents, gives us the ability to carry out and fulfill the duties that God has given us. To operate in the gifts that God has given us. The spirit of God that we receive gives us those skills, gives us those special abilities to accomplish, to live up to our responsibilities. And finally, brothers and sisters, we can't be operating in these abilities. We can't be operating in these skills endeavoring to fulfill our responsibility, endeavoring to fulfill our duties, dispensing our God-given gifts to the world in a haphazard manner. Everything that comes from God must be operated in in an orderly fashion. God is not the author of confusion. And that is why we have the different offices and appointments, gifts given to us by Christ. Nurses have the ability and the skills. Some of them may be similar to the skills a doctor possesses. And doctors have skills, special talents and abilities, some of which which are similar to that of a nurse's. But what we don't see happening in a hospital setting is a nurse doing what doctors do and doctors doing what a nurse is supposed to be doing. We don't see chaos happening in a hospital setting. Each individual with their gifts, their special talents and abilities and their responsibilities. Doctors, nurses, janitors, administrators, technicians, all of these individuals. They perform their jobs. They fulfill their duties in an orderly fashion. They do this because they know the scope of their appointments. They know the limits of the office that they hold and that they are operating within. Brothers and sisters, this is no different than the appointments and the offices that are set up by our Lord Jesus Christ for his church and the orderly functioning of his church in the earth. We have several gifts. We have several abilities and talents that are given to us by God and by the Holy Spirit. Different individuals possess different gifts. All of them are members of the body of Christ, faithful believers. We are to be unified under God in Christ's church. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit, the one spirit. But we must be operating in an orderly manner. And now that we've been introduced to the gifts, the duties and the appointments, the structure of the Christian church, the responsibilities of the Christian church and the abilities and talents that each believer possesses and have been given by God and by the Holy Spirit and by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that we have been introduced to these things, brothers and sisters, we as believers must put them together. We must begin to use them in an orderly and unified manner. 
We have to put them together and make them work. I would like to get into that now on how we put them together and make them work. But brothers and sisters, that will be the discussion in part two of this message. This is a lot of information to go over. The gifts from God, which turn into our duties and responsibilities to dispense these gifts to the world. The appointments and offices from Christ. Those departments in which we are to perform our duties and responsibilities. And then there are the abilities and the talents, the skills that each one of us have been given, special skills. We all possess a different measure of a gift and a skill, a talent and an office. And for us, we are to find out what are our specific giftings? How has God blessed us? What gift do we have? What talent and ability are we operating in by the Holy Spirit? This is what we do individually. The next step is to put them together with others to work within our local church community, to work within our family, to work within our neighborhoods, to minister these gifts, these talents and these abilities, operate in these offices in the world. That will be in part two of this message. And I pray that we are able to hear this word of the Lord. May this word of the Lord come into us and change our hearts and minds according to God's will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.